feel like I need to go watch Waiting again. You know, I really do. It still holds up. There is there are some things that people, a, a modern audience, won't enjoy, like uh, uh, Monty's uh, love of underage girls. There's still, I was going to say, she was going to be turning 18 in a week, and he wouldn't touch her until then. So, you know, Monty was, was okay. It's marginal. <laughs> so. It's marginal. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I mean, he's, 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 he's a cut her away from statutory rape. <laughs> yeah. Thin curly line? So. <laughs> well, she, she looked Italian or something like that, so probably, yeah. 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 He's Tony. I'm Mike. We're here to watch World Fire. In this episode, we'll be covering 2016 The Endless, a uh, science fiction, I won't call it a thriller. I don't think it's quite a horror, but it's a thriller. Um, I, I actually, I would call it horror, but I would call it very specifically Lovecraftian horror. Well, there's no real blood or guts Really? Um, there's a little blood. There's no, there's no real killing. There's a uh, little killing. Huh? There's a little killing. <laughs> there, there is, but it's it's not a slasher type of horror. It's not murder. No, no. So I'm gonna call it a thriller. You can call it horror. I'm gonna call it a thriller. I, I'm I will refer to it as a horror film. So, but uh, <laughs> so it is directed and produced and stars. Uh, Justin Benson and Moorhead. Uh, Justin plays uh, Justin Smith, the older brother. Uh, Aaron plays Aaron Smith, the younger brother. Uh, Justin Benson wrote the film. Uh, Aaron Moorhead was the uh, cinematographer. Uh, both of them collaborated on the uh, the edit of the film. Let's see here. The was released or premiered on uh, in 2017 the Tribeca Film Festival, and then it was released uh, nationwide in 2018. Mm -hmm. um, we couldn't find any real budget numbers for this, but you said you found numbers on their first film. Their first uh, film was twenty thousand. Yeah, their first film was a twenty thousand dollar film, and and apparently it's the the prequel to this film. I don't want to call it a prequel. It was, it was made first. It was the first film. This is set in the same universe. The name of that film is The Resolution, and that had a $20,000 budget. This one is still considered micro-budget, and normally a micro-budget film is $50,000 or less. So so if, if they only spent $50,000, fucking bravo. Yeah, um, yeah. It's, it's a good-looking film. Um, I, I would I wouldn't be uh, hard pressed if it, if somebody said that this is probably like a, um, you know, closer to a million, maybe even five million dollars. Um, sure. Yeah. You know, because I mean, we've seen like Blumhouse films that have is that a typical Blumhouse film budget for horror? Normally, it's five to ten million for a Blumhouse film. And I think this is every bit a uh, that that same level of quality, probably even just a tad bit better in some cases. I, I will say this. It is it is incredibly well written. Um and, and that right there, they started off with a good script. Yes. And, and yes. you know what? A good script will save you a ton of stuff. Plus, I also get the notion from this and having had some experience with this, is that they wrote what they knew they had to work with. Mm -hmm. So rather than like, you know, and that takes nothing away from the film. But you can definitely tell that within the writing, they were budget conscious. They didn't include anything in the film that was going to be overwhelmingly expensive for them. And it works better, I think, because they weren't trying to overplay their hand. They knew what they had to work with, and they dealt with all kinds of, of little things wonderfully. It's a very creative, very interesting film. Yeah. Yeah, they're they're very smart in that regard. Um, they also had a good good acting uh, 
And let's go into the cast real quick. It's, it's pretty small. Um, we had uh, Kylie Hernandez as Anna. Uh, she's kind of the, the hottie of the film. Uh, Tate Ellington as Hal. He's kind of the face of uh, Camp Arcadia. Yeah. Um, we have uh, Lou Temple. Um, there are some who call him Tim. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I guess the best way to kind of describe him, he's kind of like the, the elder of the group. He's kind of like, uh, how how'd you best describe him? He he is most definitely the oldest person at the camp. I don't yeah. think they show anybody that's that's any older than him. Yeah. Um, it's it's kind of a I have theories about his particular character, but I don't want to go into those right now. But but yeah, he is most definitely the elder of yeah. the camp. So, so. Well, well, how's the face of the group? Tim actually I think runs it behind the scenes. He's just I think that's probably a safe assumption. He's I. I don't know if he necessarily runs it behind the scenes just because of the way that the group is, is particularly structured, but he is a commanding presence and he yeah. most definitely, I, I think he's the one that has the most experience with what they're dealing with. So he's the one that proffers information, but only to the higher ups within the group. Yeah. It's not, he, he's not the, he's not the voice of the group. He is the brain. No, awesome. yeah. yeah. So we have uh, Kira Powell as Lizzie. Uh, she's the artist. And then we have uh, James Jordan as Carl, who's kind of the, the, the crazy guy in the camp. But not really, so. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Without giving too much away. Yeah. He's, he's not insane. He's being driven insane. So, yeah. um, so. so but, but um, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't want to deep dive this plot because I don't want to give this away because the less you know about this film, the better. And for me, this is one of those movies that I was shopping for Blu-rays and I saw the box and I read the back and I thought, oh, I'll give this a try. I'd never heard of this film. I never saw a trailer for it. It was never marketed to me in any way otherwise. And I picked it up just on a whim and I watched it and immediately fell in love with this movie. Um, this is exactly the kind of film that I really enjoy. It's it's not big budget. It's not A-list actors. It is a lot of talent that came out of nowhere and just knocked me over the head. And I wanted to share this with you because I had seen it. I didn't, I know that you hadn't, but it just recently popped up on Netflix. So I knew that it would be a prime candidate for this. And, you know, I'd like to encourage as many people as possible to watch this because these are the kind of films that cinema is missing right now or missing out on for the most part. And, you know, it's a micro budget film. So we know that it's under fifty million, you know, fifty thousand dollars. But then I went and looked at the box office on this film, and it was just shy of a million. So mm -hmm. it got an art house release. Um, you know, unless you have someplace like the Tivoli or uh, the Galleria Film Theater in your city, there was no place for you to go see it. And again, because this was not a marketed film, there wasn't. 50 million YouTube trailers that, you know, were blasting out, hey, come see this movie. Um, this is one of those that easily overlooked. So I, I was glad that I found it. I, I thoroughly enjoyed everything about it. And it was, you know, a, a solid $20 purchase for me on Blu-ray. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Well, we can get a little bit into it because you got to give them some something. I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, know, no, no, so, and, and again, um, I, I thought about how to best present this. Okay, and, take it away. Um, I, I mean, I mean, you know, it's it starts off and it's a very off-putting, weird story to begin with. It starts off and you have two brothers, and they you find out that they were part of a cult and they left the cult as teenagers. They were rescued by the media, uh, so to speak, because um, the older brother blew the whistle on the cult. The older brother presented to the media that it was a strange UFO cult that they were trying to get away from. Um, and he made all kinds of, of, you know, claims that aren't necessarily true as well. But he was trying to get his brother and him out of there for fear of what may happen because he assumed that they were along the lines of Heaven's Gate, which... If you don't remember the Heaven's Gate cult, they were this weird little religion that 
popped up in Los Angeles and they all wore the same track suits and tennis shoes and they believed that a UFO was going to be coming by the earth and that they had to be ready to go so they all killed themselves. Yeah. Wasn't the UFO actually supposed to be hidden in the tail of a comet or something yeah. like that? Yes. Yeah. That's that's exactly what it was. The UFO was supposed to be coming in behind the comet, and people just laughed it off at the time. They just thought that, you know, well, these people were a little bit loony. It's, you know, no big deal, nothing to worry about, until authorities went to the place and they had to, you know, pull out all the bodies of all the followers of this guy. So there's, there's plenty of material out there, YouTube-wise. You can definitely read up on it. Your only chance to evacuate is to leave with us. Um, and this was also around the same time that this was post Waco, I think. So, you know, the whole FBI standoff with the Branch Davidians, people in general were on high alert about the dangers of cults and some of their beliefs and some of the things that, uh, you know, cult members wind up doing, like Jonestown. Yeah. And, and you know, that's one of the big famous ones. But, you know, mass suicide or basically suicide by cop, which is what a lot of people assumed Waco was. Um, so it, it starts off, and, and you're being you know, introduced to these characters as former cult members who escaped, and they are going through deprogramming, and they're trying to build a normal life for themselves. They the, aren't accepted. A, yeah, they're not accepted anywhere. Yeah. Um, they, they have they a, a shitty, shitty existence at the moment. I mean, yeah, yeah they're very tired, very depressed. Uh, I'm sorry to mean to cut you off. Go ahead. No, no, no. It's just it, you're absolutely right. They they do have a completely shitty existence. Um, they weren't formally educated, so they work as janitors. Um, that's their job. They have you know next to nothing in the way of money, so they live in a shithole apartment. Um, one of the conversations early in the film, they're talking about you know, well, what do you want, chicken or pork? And he's like, oh, I think I'll have the pork. And they're talking about what flavor ramen noodles they're going to eat. Yeah, so. So, you know, economically, they have nothing. Um, there's a big, you know, to do about a new car battery that they need because their car isn't starting like it's supposed to. So, yeah, everything about their existence, they, they thought they were, you know, escaping um, this cult, but it turns out that the real world isn't welcoming them back in. Yeah. Um, so their existence is really Spartan. And there's a, a conversation where he talks about, like, you know, two girls came up and sat down and talked to him and the older brother, you know, just told him, Hey, yeah, we were part of this cult. And immediately, you know, the encounter with the two girls comes to an end. So <laughs> it really paints a very specific picture of the kind of lives that these guys lead. And, and it's done beautifully. Um, uh, it's, it's handled, you know, without it being tongue in cheek, it's handled with the right amount of gravitas. And it also introduces the notion to these characters that life on the outside kind of sucks. And maybe going back in, you know, isn't such a bad idea that maybe things were actually better when they were still members of the cult. And, you know, Naturally, the older brother is like, no, that's crazy. You don't know what you're talking about. But, you know, the younger brother is really struggling to deal with, you know, the outside world, for lack of a better way of putting that. Yeah, yeah. And Eric is going through some severe depression. Oh, yeah. Uh, big, big time. Um, and what's interesting is uh, you find that um, they get sent a, uh, a tape. And they put this tape in, and it's uh, Anna, who's a uh, member of the camp. And so this gets this gets uh, Aaron thinking, it's like, oh wow, these these guys are alive. We thought they were dead. Um, well, the interesting interesting note on that one. Um, it's an old tape, uh, uh, and you find out the significance of this later in the film, but. If you remember, he gets the tape in the mail, and it's this oddly shaped proprietary, you know, videotape from a, a, yeah. a video camera, um, old school. And so when he's told to go buy a battery for the car, he takes $20 of their money, and he goes basically to garage sales and thrift shops trying to find what camera can actually play this tape back. And just that little $20 
made the difference between them not being able to get the battery, but it was driving Aaron crazy. He had to know what was on that particular tape. When they get the tape, it's kind of ambiguous as to the meaning of the tape. Anna says goodbye, and the older brother, Justin, he assumes that this was going to be their big kickoff, that they were all going to commit suicide. And uh, because they're still alive, you know, obviously, it's never really explained, but it's kind of hinted at that that is either an older tape or it was a tape that was shot on older equipment that was sent to them recently. Yeah. But this is what kicks off the notion that the younger brother decides he wants to go back. He wants to visit. He misses all these people. They don't have any friends. They don't have any girlfriends. Their jobs are horrible. And, and, and you know, the food that they have to eat, they, they used to actually grow vegetables and, and eat real food and he'd like to just go back and say hello to these people because he doesn't remember much of anything about growing up in the compound yeah. um so yeah uh justin relents and he's like yeah you know what we'll go back we'll spend a day and so they go back to the cult compound um and i don't want i don't I want to call it a compound, but I don't know what else to call it. So well, they, call uh, it a, they call it Camp Arcadia. So we'll just call it a camp. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Sure. So so they go back to the camp where everybody lives, and as you can imagine, there's a lot of tension going on, especially you know directed at Justin because of the things that he said to the news media, and because turns out that they grow barley and they brew ale, and that's their big source of income, but. Uh, after the news reports had come out, they had a real difficult time selling their ale to the outside world. So it really cut into the finances of the group. Justin starts to realize that some of the things that he remembered from being at the camp weren't exactly the way that he remembered them. Um, and then there's a bit more going on than he realized at the time. And uh, Aaron is completely taken in because again, he has no memory of growing up with these people. He just remembers all the good times and, and all this. But he does notice that, you know, none of them seem to have aged much since they left. And, uh, you know, Justin makes the comment of, well, you know, they're, they're a lot older than you think. You know, they're like in their 40s. And yeah. Aaron responds back, well, that's because they're not eating garbage food and stressed out every day of their life. Yeah. So um, it's, it's you know, kind of waved away with, with that little bit of dialogue. But they're introduced to um, Lizzie, who is a new member to the compound. And she is an artist. And when asked about, you know, well, how did you wind up coming here? And she says, well, I was at the, you know, asylum the mental hospital that's down the road and I got out one night and started walking and wound up here and I decided I'd rather be here than there. Um, there's, <laughs> there's a lot more to that as the story unfolds, yeah. but as it's introduced, you just assume that they took in a crazy person. <laughs> so um, Justin is reacquainting himself with the folks of the cult um, and he is... Uh, letting it be known that he's not there to make peace, that he came back because Aaron wanted to come back, not because he really wanted anything to do with it, and that they're most definitely not staying. Yeah. Um, and it's, you know, put out there that Justin has a big problem with authority, not that he has, you know, wants to escape authority. Quite the contrary, he doesn't like the idea that no one's in charge. Um, and he does not handle that well because he's looking for answers. You get a real insight into his character that he needs a sense of direction. He needs a sense of control and he needs a sense that somebody is going to be able to answer the questions that he asks. And, and, and Aaron, in regard to this is very much a movie centered around Justin, uh, more, more so than anybody else. The, the main arc of the story is his arc. Yeah, oh, definitely, definitely. So they're treated to a meal while they're there, and they get to try out the new ale, and, and like, you know, as opposed to pork-flavored ramen noodles, they're, <laughs> they have this big spread with, with green beans and vegetables. And it's, it's like, very 
it's filmed in a very flattering light. Like you could definitely tell that they wanted to make sure that that giant bowl of green beans looked beautiful when it was offered to them. So um, like all, all the things that they missed in the outside world, all the things that they didn't have as a part of their life are, are most definitely being provided for them here. And another- all the, all the stereotypical culty things that a person would think or apply to a cult is presented here. Oh yeah. Uh, a yeah. very warm, inviting, friendly environment. Everything's all lovey-dovey. Everything's all fucking hugs and kisses and all this shit. Um, you know, they, you know, they they woo uh, Aaron so so easily. And of course, he's ready to accept that, that type of uh, you know uh, affection anyway. He's he's been yeah. missing it, you know, forever. You know, whereas Justin, you know, since he's the guy, you know the got away from that shit. It's very standoffish and all this stuff. You find out as it kind of goes along, you know, things ain't quite exactly what they seem. When you have the magician guy who does a card trick, you know, like you said, Justin's very impressed. But then he does another trick that yes. is quite, quite impressive that Justin can't quite explain. Um, yeah, uh, and then there's another event where they have this little uh, a tug of war uh, where uh, Aaron was able to successfully uh, win the tug of war battle with the the darkness, we'll, we'll call it. Um, Justin, when it was his turn, literally gets the line like whipped out of his hands. It's like the crack of a whip and he's like, you know, scarred hands now. So he's like, he can't explain that shit either. So there are some weird things that are going about there. Um, and so Justin tries to investigate what's going on and find out what's going on. He asks Hal for answers, and Hal always gives cryptic answers. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, while uh, Aaron, on the other hand, appears to be more and more thinking like, you know, he's really wanting to stay. He winds up asking his brother for a second night is what it really all boils down to. And uh, uh, when asked, when asking some questions, Justin is basically told, hey, you know what? Get in the boat, go out to this buoy, dive down and see what you find, and maybe you'll get your answer. And, and again, it's very cryptic. He's not, he's, he can't answer his question because he doesn't know. He just knows, you know, what direction to point him in to yeah. look for the answer. Um, and, uh, they go out on the boat and they're fishing and, and it's very obvious that they're having a much longer conversation, but you only catch like one line, uh, you know, a couple lines of dialogue uh, before he decides that he's going to, you know, take a jump on, you know, jump and, and go into the water and try to find out what it is that's down at the bottom of that buoy. Well, that's way culty. And he returns to the boat with a sunken toolbox, but he's also terrified. Uh, mm -hmm. At the same time, he saw something down there. He doesn't know what, but he's terrified. Um, and uh, they go back to the well. They go back to the. Uh, uh, they go back to shore, and, and they're sitting at a, at a picnic table with with the uh, the toolbox. They pulls yeah. up, and he opens it up. I love this because all you see is a bunch of rocks. So it's like. Oh, what, you know, what the fuck was that just planted down there? You know, was that there just to fuck with people? And he starts pulling out the rocks. But eventually he finds a cassette just like what was sent to them uh, earlier in the movie, a videotape. We're leaving. It's a tape. Just, Justin and Aaron, you know, they're there for their final dinner. You know, they're, you know, they're, they're going to leave that night. They're, they are actually just getting ready to walk out the door. The house like, hey, you mind if we get a little culty in here one last time? You know, in, indulge me for one more culty little thing. Yeah. And uh, so then he puts the tape in, and it's uh, the footage of uh, Justin talking about the cult, right? Yeah, it's, it's the news footage that yeah, he recorded footage. way back when they actually left the cult. Um, and, and you also find out that the reason that the kids, like, became members or, or how they wound up in the care of the group is uh, their mother had died in a car accident. Mm -hmm. And um, Tim found them. I think it was Tim that actually says that he found them. No, I think it's Hal. Was it Hal? Hal? Okay. They had so, a confrontation right after that. 
they go outside and uh, Justin and Hal have yeah, a conversation. Yeah. You know, Hal's like, well, well, Justin asked, well, what's this all about? And Hal's like, well, I think it's a sign of forgiveness. We're forgiving you, even though you, even, you know, I, we say, you know, I saved you. We brought you home. We did all this stuff for you. You left. You shat all over us. But you know what? We're still willing to forgive you. And if you don't like that, well, then fuck you. You can leave. <laughs> See you later. You know. So the, uh, so then you know, it's it's kind of interesting how the tables kind of turned then on him. You know, <laughs> in yeah, that regard. And, and you know, Aaron is talking about staying because mm -hmm. um, he he doesn't want to go back. He. he feels like you know this is home this is you know kind of they're they're accepting and they're warm and and they talk to him and he's not the kid from a cult you know anymore at least not at the compound or the camp justin and and uh how have their blowout aaron's deciding that he's going to stay and uh he goes to his car and tries to start it and the battery's dead. <laughs> so this all ties back to that video cassette, you know, and, and them having to buy a camera so they could play that particular tape back. Um, so he gets out of the car and he, apparently he's going to walk. Um, he's just, you know, getting out of there. Um, and that's when things kind of start to take a turn to the surreal. And this is kind of where I, I don't want to talk too much in specifics about the film because... This kind of gives you, explains all the odd yeah. things that yeah. are happening throughout the film. And, yeah. and it introduces some wonderfully memorable characters that, that mm -hmm. like, they all have their little, you know, weird quirks that are going on. But you begin to understand their quirks as they explain it um, and as they begin to reveal what the mystery is and what's yeah. really going on there. Um, and it all ties together so beautifully Mm -hmm. that I feel like talking about it in depth and going through it step by step is a disservice to anybody that's going to want to watch this film because it is such an intriguing mystery and it is so it is handled so amazingly well and it is presented in such a, a visually stunning way. Yeah. So yeah, it is. Uh, I will say this. So uh, throughout the movie, uh, Justin Oses shitty Carl kind of run about here and there. Um, and he tries to talk to me, can never quite get through to him. Well, as uh, here towards the end, he stumbles upon shitty Carl. And then that's where you things start to unfold. You know, they take they take the cards away from the chest and display everything for you. And that's where you really start getting your answers. Um, and I'm gonna leave it at at, at that. Um, uh, so I, I guess really at, at this point, um, do you just want to talk about our thoughts on it or I, where do we I, go from I, here? Because I, if we go I, any further, then we're going to start really getting into the thing. You yeah. Know? Yeah. If we go any further, we're going to spoil the hell out of the movie. And I, I don't want to do that. Yeah. This movie deserves to be gone into knowing as little as possible about it. Yeah. But I will say that it is, it is a very satisfying ending. It is a, a really interesting and intriguing mystery that unfolds and and again the way that they present it the way that that mystery begins to unravel and they explain it to the audience it's done with the credit of a really smart script and visually the storytelling visually is just spot on it it, it is everything that you want it is it is the epitome of efficient storytelling in that they did not show you anything that you don't need to know. Yeah. You know? And and again, it explains everything really, really well. And and some people might have a little bit of a, a time unraveling the movie. Watch it again. It'll all make sense. If you watch it one time and you get to the end and you're like, wait, what? Watch it again. It will become clear. You just got to put your phone down and pay attention to the movie. <laughs> it's all there. Yeah. But if you're if you're like, you know, staring off to the side or checking out what's going on on Reddit, what at the you're going to miss it completely and you're not giving this film its due. So yeah. so, so I, last couple times I've picked a movie, you have have like you kind of liked it, but you wouldn't recommend it. I want to know cuz I had seen this movie a couple times before. 
Tell me what you thought about this. I really enjoyed this film. I like this film a lot, and I'm happy you recommended it. Um, at first, I was worried because um, at the very beginning, it, the first few minutes looks like it's going to be like some type of stupid found footage film or something like that. And it comes across really, really low budget. At first, I'm like, oh, fuck, dude. What the hell did you get me into? <laughs> um, and uh, I, I'll admit, I, you know, the first five, ten minutes, I was kind of tuned out. I had my phone out for a second, and, and then there, I put it down and kind of looked at it, and I was like, started paying attention. I'm like, oh, okay, we're starting to pick up. Okay, we got some interesting stuff going on here. Um, but once I got past that first 10, 15 minutes and really got uh, invested in the uh, the relationship, um, and that's a credit to the, the two actors, uh, Justin and Aaron are really good actors. And you can tell they've been working together for a long time because yeah. their chemistry is, is, is obvious. You, you believe them as brothers, and, you know, in a way they are, I'm sure they are brothers and, you know, not in a uh, blood sense, but definitely in a, uh, you know, friendship sense. Yeah. Um, so that that's what got me invested in first uh, was their uh, chemistry on screen, um, and like you said before, uh, earlier, the the story is fantastic. They do a great job crafting the story, um, and there's just enough uh, supernatural things that are peppered in there at first to really get you hooked in and. You know, like I said earlier, they keep things very close to the chest and they slowly reveal a little more, a little more, and a little yeah. more, a little more. And once you see uh, shitty Carl, all the cars are on the table then. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I have mixed feelings about that. I would like a little bit more uh, ambiguity, but at the same time, uh, I kind of like that, that they did do that. Because if, if you do pay attention, the first time, I think I think you'll get everything you need on, on the first go if you pay attention enough. And if you don't, that's fine. Watch it again because I think rewatching it, you'll probably appreciate it even more. So I think rewatchability is definitely going to be there yes. Yes. for sure. Um, what else? Uh, the 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 effects are well done. Um, like. Uh, I don't want to give too many details away, but there's there's some uh, illusional effects, um, things that have to do with the uh, the moon, um, especially in the evening. Uh, and oh, what else? I was gonna say that's that's one thing. I, I will also say this, and and I don't think this this doesn't give anything away, but like the yeah. first the first hint that you get that things aren't quite what they seem is uh, Anna takes um, Aaron out for a walk mm -hmm. in the evening and she walks him up to this ridge and as they're looking out there is this reflection of the moon and it, it appears that there's two moons in the side yeah or it appears that there's two moons it's like a side mirror side image of the side. sky is what it and, is and when he asks about it she's like you know it's it's a heat thing it's it's a refraction of the light i don't quite understand it myself but you know you should be here when there's three moons out and yeah. and you know, that's that's kind of the first clue that, you know, she's really trying to get Aaron to want to stay with them. Plus the fact that, you know, she's an attractive woman. He's obviously a, a younger guy, but he has never had an intimate relationship with a woman. And they're very clear about that several times uh, yeah. that he's really got a Jones for, you know, the, the fairer sex. But at the same time. Um, he's never been able to, you know, actually get involved with anybody because of his background. Yeah. And I love that interplay because there's an honesty and an authenticity to that. And that's that's one of those things that I keep hammering on. We talk about a lot of films. I, I put a lot of value in a film that in its context it buys into its own world. I, I hate movies where they're winking at you or they're kind of nudging you. Hey, it's tongue in cheek. Look, it's funny. Ha ha. I, I oh, can't stand it. It immediately rips me right out of the film. And this is one of those movies that it's dealing with some really oddball stuff, some really strange and, and alien ideas. Mm -hmm. um, and yet it presents them in a way that is completely believable. The characters within the film they may not have all the answers, but they are dealing with it in completely believable ways. So um, you, you really, you feel for the two brothers because, 
you know, again, everybody that's gone to high school knows the weird kid and they are the weird kids and they're the ones that have the weird family history. So you get it. It doesn't change through adult life. You have the weird neighbor now, (laughs) but, uh, you know, same sort of thing. Um, the other thing I like about this film too, is the way it handles, uh, Lovecraftian style, uh, themes and things like that. Um, you know, where Lovecraftian is, is like uh, alien and otherworldly things and, and kind of highbrow concepts. And I like how smartly these guys handled, handled this uh, subject in a way that I think, um, oh, oh, what's his name? Who, who's the guy who thinks he's like fucking Mr. Pretentious? Uh, Christopher Nolan, you need to take notes from these writers. Um, these guys do high concept right. And with no budget in a way that you with all your millions of dollars can never achieve <laughs> stop smelling your own farts get your how your fucking ass let someone else write your fucking movies for you or or just dial it back a little bit i i, I, I don't know i like christopher nolan but i will say that there's been several films in his uh catalog that that i i could care less for and you know the prestige is one of them the prestige if, if you're like mirroring the prestige in this movie if you're reflecting these two no i'm really colors. more reflecting like his later films you know like fucking uh inception, inception and fucking you know movies like that you know where it's all of you know it's it's all effects it's all spectacle and i'm gonna throw this convoluted prop plot you know to try to tell you all these themes and bullshit that never really tie together or work very well and I gotta do it through, you know, three hours of storytelling, but you know, you get nothing really substantial at the end. It's it's garbage. I'm sorry. He he sucks. He the funny thing is Christopher Nolan is known for all this highbrow bullshit, but yet his best movies are fucking comic book movies. Um I'm gonna say that Christopher Nolan is he's, he's considered a film auteur. Um that well, he does. He doesn't. No well. I take that back. His best film is Memento. It's the one time he got highbrow shit fucking right, and that's so, it. I I enjoyed Memento. I uh, enjoyed following. Um, uh, I all the Batman movies. I, I like all those. I'm not a fan of the Prestige. I think it's pretentious. I think it's overdone, and and it's not nearly as interesting a mystery as it's presented as. Um, and I guess that's the whole thing. The the whole big reveal of what's really going on falls flat. Whereas in this film, quite the opposite. When you actually find out what's going on, you're like, it's a bit of a, a mind bender. It's one of those, wow, okay, that's really cool. Yeah. So I, I wish Christopher Nolan could, you know, put the exclamation point at the end of his sentences like these guys do. This is a, a much... It's a similar kind of concept that it's a big mystery and you're unraveling it. You're getting little clues here and there, and and you're, you're following the characters as they're trying to take the mystery apart and make it all make sense. And it's the reveal at the end that is disappointing. And that holds true for the Prestige. That holds true for Inception, which I I saw Inception. All these people were like, "Ooh, Inception!" And I'm like, "What about it? Yeah, a dream within a dream within a dream. Woo." You know what? Yeah, I, I, I've gotten really high and had conversations. <laughs> what if it's a, a dream within a dream within a dream? Ooh, yeah. Sorry. I hope Christopher <laughs> Cohen gets really good weed from somewhere because that's literally how Inception came off to me. So, you know, I, I totally get it. I I like Nolan when he's telling a straightforward story. When he is a A to B to C, hey, let's follow these characters, let's see what they do. I enjoy that. When he does his, you know, J.J. Abrams style, who I I fucking loathe, but mm-hmm. when he does his mystery box, you know, let's unravel this, let's let's explore this with these characters, it, it always is a dud. Um, and you know, I, I mean, if it's gripping for the first two and a half hours. And the last 15 minutes, you blow it. If your movie's a fail, this one I have rewatched several times, and this is one of those movies that, for rewatchability, 
after the big reveal, after you like, you know, get to the end and the, the mystery is explained, when you go back and rewatch this movie, you get so much more out of it because then you start picking up everything that's really, you know, going on in the background and all the little hints that are dropped throughout. And I love that about this movie that that it is one of those that you can watch it get your mind blown go back and rewatch it and it loses nothing because of it's so strongly you know character driven and the characters are interesting and endearing and entertaining and and it's gripping it's yeah. it, it, for, for lack of a better word it's genuinely a gripping film you you really want to as weird as it is and and this is going to sound kind of strange, but as much as society on the whole treat these two brothers as completely outcasts because of the vehicle of this movie, you really want to get to know these two. Yeah. So anyway, I think, well, I, after seeing this, I am look, I want to watch, uh, their, uh, their first film. Uh, was it, the, was it the reckoning? Uh, was the resolution. The resolution. The um, yeah. I want to watch that for sure. Um, uh, and, Hopefully they got something else that works. Cause I, I really like to see it, uh, whatever it is. Um, I'm, I'm, th this movie won me over with with them as a writer combo. So yeah, it's it's just sad to me that like these filmmakers, rather than getting to you know you know what you did all that on a fifty thousand dollar budget, here's ten million. Go make whatever you want. Rather than that being the state of things and us getting some really interesting and intriguing movies, sadly, you see these indie directors being plucked out of independent cinema, being thrown into the studio system. And, you know, take a look at, at Josh Trask. He was one of these small indie directors, and he got, you know, he had one of his films blow up, and next thing you know, they saddle him with the fan force yes, the, yeah. movie. <laughs> and, and, like, they legitimately destroyed that man's career. And it's like, well, you know, they did that with him. They did that with uh, Edgar Wright with Ant-Man. They did that again with the... Uh, I forgot who the director was supposed to be for uh, Solo, but they yanked him on there, replaced him with Ron Howard. Oh, it was the two guys. It was the two guys. I yeah. can't remember their names, but yeah, no. They, they they had a hit film. It was a little indie film. It was a hit film. And yeah, they, they this isn't the Han Solo movie that we wanted. Oh, let's get rid of you. And, you know, Ron Howard likes money. <laughs> Making it rain. <laughs> so, so oh, yeah. Shit. Yeah. Hopefully, a smaller studio picks these guys up. I would love to see them, like with A24 or Blumhouse or something like that. Yeah. Who I'm not a fan of their films, but at least they can get a decent budget. Hopefully, they won't get fucked with there, and you know they'll be smart and let them do their thing. You know. Yeah. Well, that's kind of what A24 and Blumhouse are known for. Is you know what? Here's enough money for you to make. A respectable movie go make a movie and that's how we wound up getting films like uh hereditary but uh, uh we got that uh, jordan peele got to leave comedy behind and go do horror films because of a24 and blumhouse and you know um so yeah i mean keep doing what you're doing a24 and blumhouse i'm going to see anything that you put out regardless and and you know if i i see it and like it i'm gonna be buying the blu-ray as well i honestly think that the pandemic is gonna be what winds up saving independent cinema because right now that's the only thing that's being put out there is independent cinema and why because they don't need to have a 250 million dollar opening weekend to get their investment back and that's kind of awesome and that's kind of why i love going and finding little indie films that no one has ever heard of and going, hey, dude, check this out. It's good. It's really good. And that's exactly what The Endless is. It's good. It's good. It's really, really good. And yeah, I, I want to see these guys get as many $10 million film budgets as they can stand to do. Absolutely. I never yeah. want to see them get a hundred million dollar budget because yeah. that's the end. Because the minute you're dealing with a hundred million dollars is the minute every asshole in the studio boardroom is going, well, you know, to appeal to as wide an audience as possible, we feel that you need a more attractive female lead mm -hmm. and that she should do this, not that. Yeah. And that's, that's what I hate. I hate the boardroom. I hate the business end of cinema at this point. So... Um, there's another uh, film out there right now on Netflix that I'm, I'm still trying to get you to watch. You need to watch it. I'm throwing this out there as a recommendation. The Devil All the Time, 
with Tom Holland, uh, who's your Spider-Man, current Spider-Man. Uh, <laughs> and I know for people that hate Marvel or don't like Spider-Man, give this movie a chance. It's a little budget film. It's got a great story to it. It's, it's, it's a very dark movie. Uh, I will throw it out there. So it's kind of appropriate for the season two. It's not a horror film, but there's some depth, there's some killing, there's some fucked up shit that goes on this movie. Uh, so check that out. Um, do you have any other uh, quick recommendations? Um, you know what? If if you watch The Endless and you enjoy this, I'm going to uh, recommend that you check out uh, Jameen Winans, who did Ink, and he also did The Frame. And while Ink has kind of achieved cult status, The Frame, which was a follow-up, and I think is actually a deeper film. Um, Ink is, is a very surreal movie, and, you know, uh, uh, it did get some notice. It was one of those films that oddly became famous because it became pirated. Um, but uh, <laughs> the, the Frame was his follow-up, and the frame is, it's smart, and it's deep, and it is one of those movies that very much like this, it's a mystery that, that you're going along with to unravel, and it's it's really well done. Um, that would be probably like the next step on this. The flip side is, I would also recommend The Void. Um, oh, yes. And uh, we are uh, still here. Are two more horror films that I think are, you know, little bitty indie films that got their start on a small budget and a good script and did the indie circuit and got picked up for distribution. If you haven't checked those out, highly, highly recommend. I think you'll enjoy all of those films. Um, but yeah, at the end of the day, I just want to encourage people that, you know what, explore more independent cinema. There's some really great stuff out there and there's all kinds of proof that you do not need $200 million to make a compelling film that is highly watchable and rewatchable. Yeah. So, Mike, what are we watching next? Next, we are watching 1979's Phantasm. <laughs> yes, yes. A uh, good cult horror movie. Not too many people know about it. Um, I think you guys are really going to enjoy it. So, well, then we will catch you next time. <laughs> See ya. Peace! <laughs>